about 18 months ago, January of 2021, I don't know if y'all remember, but Milo and Raquel Saravalli were here from Nicaragua and spoke, uh, I believe it was a Wednesday night, and on the table back there, they had little, probably two inch square cards like this. And they had different names and different pictures. And they asked if you wanted to, to pick one up and use that as a reminder to pray for that particular individual. I picked up this one and it says, pray for Anthony Sanchez. He's a student of the Biblical Institute. Pray for discipline in the Bible and prayer, maturity, future decisions, family, and studies. I've kept this right up on my desk, so every morning when I'm in there, I see that, and it's a continuing reminder to pray for Anthony Sanchez. That same month, I found that he was on Facebook, so I sent him a, a message and told him about having this card and his picture on my desk. But now there's just one problem. Anthony Sanchez speaks only Spanish, and I speak only English. Thankfully, there is a, a gadget on the internet called Google Translate. So I can type in whatever I want to say in English, and it translates it to Spanish, and I can copy that and then put it into a message to him. And over the last year and a half, we've communicated that way back and forth very successfully. And I'm thankful for in inventions and innovations like Google Translate. Um, earlier this month, barely, I guess it's almost, almost June, but earlier this month, a couple of weeks ago, actually while we were on vacation, I got a message from uh, Anthony Oh, and also, most of you know that we've got a grandson, Cole, that's also studying for the ministry. And this being up there, when, it, when I'm reminded to pray for Anthony, it also helps remind me to pray for our grandson, Cole. But I got this message from Anthony, and it says, Hi, how are you, Robert? It's been a month now that I've been studying in the book of John, chapter 17, and I have learned a lot during that time, and today I want to share with you something I learned from Jesus. During the time that I was studying the book of John, chapter 17, I noticed something that Jesus did at, the moment, at that moment in his life, and I'm going to share a verse with you so you can see it too. In John 17, 9, it says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but those, who, who, but those you gave me, because they are yours. During my Bible study, I focused on a lot on this verse where Jesus is praying and thanking God for those who are with him. I want to do the same for you, and I want to thank God because he gave me the opportunity to meet you and that you are forming a part of my life. I just wanted to know you to know and remember that I will be praying for you so that God does his will in your life. Folks, that is humbling. <laughs> he, he and I swapped a couple of more, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of more messages after that. And I told him that I was going to be teaching today. And he's going to be praying. <laughs> Obviously, I need that prayer. Now, I've never met Anthony Sanchez. Chances are I never will because we live half a world away, but we, we both pray for each other and we, we are committed to that prayer for each other. Today's scripture actually comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. So if you'll turn there, and I, I want to tell you, I, most of you know that Esther and I weren't here last Sunday. We were sick, and so we watched the video of the service, and when Evan Burton got up here and started his lesson and said, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, 
I looked over at Esther and I said, that's where I'm going to be teaching from next week. And this is something that Charles asked me about filling in probably a month ago or a little longer. And this verse has been on my heart that entire time. The fact that Evan felt led to, to teach from this verse, and I do too, I think there's a really good lesson there that we, we need to follow our hearts when God is leading us. As I listened to Evan's message, though, I realized that we were coming at it from completely different directions, which is one of the great things about Bible study. There's so many ways to study single verses or a group of verses. Evan started with verse 17 and went forward, and I'm actually going to do the opposite. I'm going to back up a little bit and give a little background here in a minute. But first, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Uh, King J the New King James Version and the ESV and other translations say he is a new creation instead of a new creature. This young Anthony Sanchez and I both have experienced becoming a new creation because of our trust and salvation through Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to become a new creation? First of all, it says to be, uh, what does it mean to be in Christ? And second, what does it mean to when it says all things are become new? Uh, this is probably one of Paul's most well-known verses and maybe one of the most well-known in the Bible, but I, I, didn't, I don't know how well I understood it before I really delved into this study. And we notice that that verse begins with the word therefore and is I have learned in this church over the years, anytime a sentence begin or a verse begins with therefore, we need to back up and find what it's there for. So let's back up a little bit. Let's go to chapter 5 and verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all, that those who live again should live no longer for themselves, listen to this, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul felt compelled by the love of Christ. He says the love of Christ compels us. Um, and I, I strongly suspect, we don't have this really documented that well in the Bible or at all, but I suspect that when people would ask Paul why on earth do you go through the imprisonments? Why do you go through the torture, the beatings, all, everything that you go through just to preach the word of, of God? I suspect he would say, I have to because I have the love of God in my heart, the love of Christ in my heart. In return, I love Christ because he loves me. And I have the love of Jesus for other people. And he wants to get that message out so that others can believe and be saved. Paul was compelled by the love of Christ, and so should we be. The love of Christ compels us, it leads us, and guides us. And it, it should lead us to love one another and to do whatever we can for each other to reflect Christ in our life and to be a witness for him. The Apostle Paul is reminding us here that Christ died for you, for me, and he said that if one died for all, and really that if should be since, so it should read, since one died for all, then all died. And I think we need to clarify here what Paul meant when he said, use the word all, because there's a universalism theory out there that Christ died for all, so consequently everybody's going to heaven. Absolutely false teaching and nothing could be further from the truth. It's certainly true that when Christ died, he died for anyone who believes that he is truly the Son of God, that he was crucified, buried, and three days later he arose. 
that is what grants people salvation, the belief of that. Um, John 2.2, 2, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 John 2.2 2 tells us, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for our only, but for the whole world. And John 3.16, very familiar verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, but here's the key word, believeth. Whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. Now, I, I admit I am not what I would consider a scholar of the Bible. I, I study, but I always want to make sure that when I get up here, I'm conveying a proper message to y'all. And I, I don't hesitate to ask Pastor Charles sometimes to review my thoughts and tell me if I'm thinking along the right lines. And so, Pastor Charles defines that, this all, this way and helps, I mean, it's, it basically is what I was thinking, but he puts it so well. He says, it's a tricky verse because in a sense, there, there is a sense in which Christ did die for all. He took on everyone's sin on himself, whether they believe it and accept it or not. But the only way to get the new life is to accept his death as our substitute. So thank you, Charles, in, in absence for that. Christ's sacrifice was definitely for all, but it's not automatically commuted to everyone. It requires acceptance on an individual's part. Okay, back to our scripture this morning. For the love of Christ, verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul puts it very plainly that once we're saved, we should no longer live for ourselves, but for God, for Jesus who died for us. And I think this is a really large part of being in Christ whenever we start living for him instead of for ourselves. Continuing with verse 16, therefore, and we just read, there's that word again, we just read what, the, what it's there for because the love of Christ compels us to live for him. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer. I believe Paul's saying that since he now has a relationship with Christ as a risen living savior, he can no longer associate Christ's earthly ministry with who he is today. He has, he has had a change in his own heart in his perception of Jesus because Jesus now is not just a man walking on the earth, he is risen savior for the people. Sometimes I tend to get a little sidetracked in my studies, but I think there's, there's many times that that leads me down paths that are really interesting and, and fun Bible studies. So I have a question. You notice that it says, even though I, we have known Christ according to the flesh, so, uh, so we have known Christ according to the flesh. My question is, does that mean that Paul actually knew Jesus Christ when he walked on the earth? So Bible scholars are really divided on that point, but I want to read some scriptures. Uh, let's turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and let's begin with verse 1. Then Saul, and this is before... The, Paul's conversion, so he's called Saul here. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And when the scripture references that the way, the people were of the way, that basically means they were Christians. 
And I think, I, I think that term is used five times in the book of Acts, and I think it's a very appropriate term because uh, in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So Jesus has said he is the way. So that's where that, that term comes from. And it's interesting also to note the Christian community in uh, Damascus had grown to the point that it was alarming to Saul. And he went to the chief priest and got letters granting him permission to go over there. And anybody that was found worshiping Jesus Christ was to be bound and brought back for punishment. Let's continue with Acts 9, verse 3. And he, that's Paul, journeyed as he journeyed and came near Damascus, suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice say unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So I don't know if you consider that meeting Jesus Christ, but he certainly had an encounter with Jesus Christ, but we don't know whether they actually had met during their, the, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, got three verses here I want to read from the book of Acts, and I'll just read them quickly. Now, the Lord spoken to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid but speak and do not keep silent. Uh, another one says that Paul was in a prayer and he said he was in a trance and saw him saying unto me. So Jesus certainly has spoken to Paul. And in verse, uh, another Acts reference, but the following night the Lord stood by him and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, you must also bear witness at Rome. Now these were... I believe the risen ascended Christ making appearances to Paul, but I think prior to the crucifixion, I think Paul certainly wanted to know his enemy, and I think he probably went and heard Jesus teaching and saw him, but whether they ever sat down and had a discussion, we're not really told that I'm, I've been able to find. Okay, back to our main verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Paul was no doubt in Christ after his blinding experience on the road to Damascus. And he became, at that moment, once he became a, a believer, he became a new creation. Uh, does that mean that Paul received a, a new body that was new and improved over his old body? Of course not. Uh, his name was changed from Saul to Paul, but that still didn't make him a different person. He was still the same human, but with the change that took place inside in his heart. He went from a man who hated anyone who followed Jesus Christ to probably becoming the most faithful and diligent teacher of the grace of of God and salvation through the grace of God that's ever walked the earth. Now, does accepting Christ our Savior and being in Christ make us sin proof? I think every one of us sitting here easily knows the answer to that. We all sin. I think it would be wonderful if when we became Christians, we could no longer sin, but we have free will. We have the Holy Spirit in our inside us and we, we need to lean on the Holy Spirit for guidance and direction but we get out of the will and we sin and sometimes we get mired deep in sin once we accept Jesus into our life make the decision to follow him and allow the Holy Spirit at that moment we are in Christ 
But I'll tell you something else that happens at that exact same moment. We become targets for Satan. Satan will do everything in his power to pull us away. He'll tempt us with sin. He'll flood us with distractions. That is his mission. To make sure we're not good Christian examples. To make us question our own salvation. And to hinder us from our daily walk with God. But you know, when you get right down to it, it's a good thing when Satan tempts you and tests you because if he's not tes testing and tempting you, he's got you right where he wants you. He doesn't need to do it. You, you're doing fine on your own. So we need to stand strong against the temptations that come to us, but be thankful that we are living a life that Satan feels is a hindrance to what he wants to accomplish. We know that Paul had interruptions. He was not, not a perfect man. He sinned. He was human. But in general, we believe that Paul wrote the book of uh, Hebrews. And if you'll turn to Hebrews 12, 1, Hebrews 12, beginning with verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand, at, at the right hand of the throne of God. So here we have Paul himself acknowledging that he's a sinner. You notice he doesn't say, let you lay aside the sin. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. So he's including himself in that too. Now if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, we're going to begin with verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feelings, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanliness and greediness. This tells us that it's a matter of mind and heart to becoming a new creation, to becoming a new man. We're told here we should not walk in the futil futility of our minds and don't be alienated from God because of the blindness of our heart. Paul is warning us to keep our hearts and minds clean. <clears throat> Continuing there in Ephesians, but you have not learned Christ if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct or your, the old man, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created to God in true righteousness and holiness. God has created a new man for each of us that has accepted him and become a follower of him to believe that has believed in his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 22 tells us to put off the, old, the former conduct, the old man that, that's corrupt, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. But you know what? It doesn't stop there. Verse 24 says that you put on the new man which was created to God in true righteousness. So it's not just a matter of putting off the old man, but we also need to put on the new man again that was created specifically for us. Renewed in the spirit of our mind and putting on the new man that God has created for us. And I know for me personally, sometimes that's really hard to understand. I mean, 
we don't have minds that can fathom eternity past and eternity future. How do we fathom having a Holy Spirit within us and, you know, just the, all the different aspects of Christianity. Sometimes it, it can be mind-boggling, honestly. Um, and sometimes that can lead to doubt in our own minds about our salvation. While I was preparing uh, this lesson, I came across a website called knowingjesus.com and I thought they had a really good point here. It says, it is the sin of unbelief that can easily ensnare and entangle us, for unbelief can become an unbearable weight on our hearts, which fosters fear and chokes our faith. When trust in God begins to falter, it is unbelief that hampers our progress. When seeds of doubt are allowed to take root and flourish, it renders us powerless in our Christian walk and taints our testimony. And I think that's so true. Not just that we doubt whether we're saved or we doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, but any kind of doubt that we allow to enter into our Christian walk, it can, it can have that bad influence on us. In the book of Hebrews, there are cases of re where it recounts a list of people who are actually commended by God for their faithfulness. These people are referred to in Hebrews 12.1 as a great cloud of witnesses. And their lives did serve as a witness for Jesus and a demonstration of encouragement for others to run that race that's set before them. They walked the walk as well as talking the talk. They lived for God daily and encouraged others too. And remember, that was the Apostle Paul himself that said, let us lay, wide, lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. So back to our question, what does it mean to become a new creation? If you remember when you first became a Christian, when you accepted Christ, I suspect you had just a really good feeling inside being welcomed into the family of God. It was a, a relief, it was excitement, it was, it was feeling love from a lot of people in our, in our church community or in your church community at the time. And do you know, once you accepted Christ, your former life was dead and gone. It is erased. Your past sins were forgiven and forgotten. Just one little problem there. They were forgiven and forgotten by God. But what about you? Did you forget them and just move on? Or do you still carry that burden with you? It's so hard for us to erase in our mind things that we've done in the past that we knew we shouldn't, words that we've spoken to people that we know we shouldn't, actions that we've done. But you know what, that's a completely different lesson for another time, but I do feel like sometimes our inability to forget our past sins actually becomes a hindrance in our Christian walk. We need to learn from our mistakes and then forget them and thank God for the forgiveness of those sins. Once we're saved, we're spotless in the sight of God because of his son, Jesus Christ. When we become new creatures in God's sight, not one living in filth and sin, but a new creation, spotless because of the death, burial, and resurrection of his own son, it's because of God's grace. When Donna sent out the songs for this week, last Sunday, she had no idea what I was going to be teaching about. But I think that song, that first song we sang, could have served as the, as the lesson for today in itself. I think it's wonderful. I'm going to read those words again. I know we just sang it a half hour ago, but I don't think we should ever tire of it. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, 
setting my spirit free. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful grace of Jesus reaching the most defiled by its transforming power, making me God's dear child, purchasing peace in heaven for all eternity, and the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. And in the course, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, wonderful grace all sufficient for me, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. O oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name. Wrapping up, I'd like for you to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we kind of backed up a little bit. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, again, I think, again, we can't hear this too much. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And our last passage, let's turn to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2, and we'll, start, uh, we'll read verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We're still living today in a body of flesh and blood, but as Christians, we should live by faith and serve God and do everything in our power to live for him instead of ourselves. I hope we can all leave here today with a renewed desire to be compelled to live our lives for him, for Jesus Christ, our Savior. And I thank you for your time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we ask your blessings on the words that have been spoken today. We do ask that we can always be improving and being Christian examples that we can live for you instead of for ourselves. We ask your help in accomplishing that. We pray for Anthony Sanchez and other young men studying to become pastors or teachers. We pray your blessings on them for their focus, for their study, for their commitment. Thank you for our church and church family again. We just thank you so much for the blessings you shower us with for each and every person that's here today. We ask for your travel protection for those that are traveling this holiday weekend and that you would just protect them and bring them back safe and sound. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.